All right, hey y'all, welcome back to a, another episode of the Chase Thomas Podcast, where you guessed it, I am still the aforementioned <laughs> Chase Thomas, and I am joined by someone um, who's out there in Los Angeles, California. But Evan cracks me up, and one of the ninety billion reasons I love Mr. Evan Swartz <laughs> is that he informed me before we got started tonight that he found a microphone. Um, I kid you not, folks. The week before the end of the NFL season, and he was like. Maybe I should go check this out. Let me go see if I have this uh, this good mic. And lo and behold, he found it and brought it to our attention. So better late than never, Mr. Evan Swords. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. I uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I had a period of my life before you and the Chase Thomas podcast where I mm-hmm. did my own podcast and interviewed. We call that BC. Po- yeah, yeah. Before, yeah, before, uh, before Chase. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. And I, you know, I, I bought a mic and had a setup and all that. And I actually like, I had bought a whole MacBook pro and ended up just giving it to the girlfriend. I was like, you mm. study and you, you, you need this. I don't need this. You take it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I don't even know why I never thought about it, but you, you kind of said something the other night and I was just like, wait, I think I have a snowball. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that's the same thing with like my webcam here. Like I have my work computer that has mm-hmm. a webcam and all the above. But I was like, wait, that's right. I have that 1080p webcam. I, sh- I wonder if it works. And I just like mm-hmm. plug it in and it immediately is like, yes, this is, yes, we work. We can use this. And same thing. Like I literally grabbed my mic. I was like, yeah, give me a second. And just mm-hmm. plugged it in and then immediately open your link and it's like yeah absolutely we can of course use the snowball mic like i like the least amount of like resistance possible to use the stuff that i've had in my possession for like 5 years incredible i i just i love that and um hey it adds more to the legend that is mr <laughs> evan swords um have you been watching murderville at all uh no but i actually and mm-hmm. and i'm so excited that for once we're 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 uh, kind of on the same page of this show because I think we yeah. we usually watch other shows. I really want to watch it. Yeah. I I think it's a great concept. I'm very excited to watch. What's your favorite? So you haven't uh, watched it at all yet. Have you watched all of them? Wait, say it again. Have you watched all of the episodes? So I fell asleep last night uh, watching the fifth episode, I want to say. But the Marshawn one is probably the weakest. But he has some he has some bangers of a lines like I want to be Detective Bagabitch, for instance, for instance, like was incredible, like him wanting to rename himself and Will Arnett getting on the phone with City Hall to rename him so that he can be that name uh, on the program. It's incredible. Like the premise is so simple, but I love when they're fa- like they break character uh, in this show. So they don't have any qualms about what it is. But like. Uh, Kumail was the best, I think, by far uh, for me. He was incredible. Like he has this walk in one scene and I think I posted it on my Instagram, but he had this one moment that's just Kumail is so funny. And him and Will Arnett are just Will Arnett's on another level at this moment. You put this guy in anything and he's just going to kill it. And it's such a silly concept and it shouldn't work like this would not work for so many other writers and air and actors and all that kind of stuff. But Evan, it's 10 out of 10. You will, you will thoroughly enjoy Murderville and it's 20 minute episodes and dude, it is, it's incredible. And it's even smart. Like you have to, the actors who come in, cause you know, the premise of it, right? We're like the, the guest yeah, star 100%. doesn't know. Yeah. So they don't know and they have to be paying attention. Like it's the little things and it's amazing that that actually does come out to be uh, important uh, in the very end. It just the show like there's only a handful of shows that get me to audibly laugh. And that's a big thing. Like I'll smile at a lot of shows where I'm like, oh, that was clever or that's that's cool. But very few actually get me to audibly laugh. And Murderville, I will say, um, gets me to audibly laugh. I, I I love that I saw the concept of it, and it's like mm. you know, obviously, you know, it's a scripted show, but one person every week, a guest, mm. you know, obviously has no lines and is supposed to completely improv the entire show. Mm. That's an idea that I think when you hear out loud, you go, "Oh, that's an amazing idea," and executives mm. will never go for it, right? Yeah. Like, and and I think we're kind of at this point now where there's just so much content that like mm. finally broke down to the point where the executive executives at these major networks are like, 
fine. We'll let you do it. <laughs> and, you know, Netflix, of course, is like, well, yeah, we'll try anything. And, mm -hmm. of course, just like how Stranger Things was, like, said no by, like, nine times, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is just – there's just ideas that I think sometimes, like, take way too long uh, mm -hmm. to get through. And this just looks like an incredible idea. You'll you'll love it. I would highly encourage you to binge it. But that is true. I hadn't really considered that with just – because there is a lot of content and like some, one thing we lose is that none of us like watch TV together anymore. Like I will always miss like the Game of Thrones Sunday nights, the Breaking Bad. I want to say Monday nights is one. No, 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 no. Don't say none of us because everyone that likes Marvel content does. It's just oh, you. No, no, that doesn't count. That's the. the, the, the what do you mean? The most popular content in the world doesn't count. The, I mean, that's not really what I'm so, saying. I'm Game saying of Thrones is just yeah. as nerdy. No, there's nothing nerdy about Game of Thrones. There's nothing. What? What's who? Whomst? Whomst among us has ever thought that uh, Song of Ice and Fire would have any any dorky nerdy elements to it? Seven hundred page <laughs> books is a is a full nerd stuff. I could get them out. I'm looking at them right now. Like I could pull them out. They're great books. Um, shout out to George R. R. Martin. Who? Uh, can you please finish Winds of Winter at some point? That would be nice. No, I don't think he's ever gonna finish the books. Unfortunately. Um. Yeah, but I guess just it's cool that the plethora of talent or the plethora of options and content and honestly, the talent, too, of just there's so many talented people that can create cool stuff um, that they're given opportunities now because you have Apple TV and all these other streaming services where they're like, we're not sure about this idea, but it doesn't sound like it's going to cost us much money. Uh, yeah, we'll give it a shot. And if it works out, great. We look like geniuses. And if not, uh, no skin off our back. Like. I think that's one of the cool things. So, yeah, I, I think that's something that's going to continue because there are a lot of those shows out there that um, are finding their niche on these random networks. Um, one of those that did not happen was Banshee, which is a top 10 show for me all time on Cinemax. Cinemax is gone. They did this great stuff. And Cinemax was one of my favorites. And I know you didn't watch Banshee, right? I'm looking it up right now. Nobody watched Banshee and it's one of the best shows of all time. And I've never been able to have another person to talk to about it. Like ever, like I, there's shows out there that I would love to talk about with somebody and no one watched it. Nobody. That it's is so good. It's one of my favorite shows ever it is. It had no business being that good. I think the person that I share the most in common with, with like my movies and television. Um, oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's Homelander from the boys is the main guy in that. Oh yeah, Anthony Starr. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, and he is—he's super cool in this show. It's so good. That show is phenomenal. Um, I cannot recommend it enough to our listeners here on the Chase Thomas podcast. Like, go check out Banshee, Cinemax. Um, go check out Murderville. All kinds of free publicity for these shows on this uh, on this edition of the program. Um, we also have to hit Mr. Swords because you're like. You have a lot of jobs. You're you work in uh, some kind of big time astro organization that I don't even know where to begin with what you do for a living now <laughs> and where you're at. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you're at Liberty. I don't know how many NDAs you've already signed for your position. So who knows what Evan towards does. I, at this point, job. like I, I wake up in the morning and I put a pair of pants on <laughs> already has an NDA in it. Really? To be honest <laughs> with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, like I will say, like I said, my, mm. my, my real life big boy job is a senior technical recruiter uh, mm. for Astra, which is a space uh, satellite launch company. It's kind of like SpaceX, but a little bit of a different take. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the head people from my company came from NASA. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, basically everybody at the, my company but me is really smart. You're smart, Evan. Yeah, you're, I love. I mean, also, you're surrounded I, by astronauts. I, I love when people say that. They're like, "Oh, Evan, you're you've got street smarts." Trust me, I know my place. Do you have street smarts? <laughs> yes, I, absolutely. You grew up in Oregon. Where are the street smarts coming from? First off, street smarts. Yes. Street smarts just mean uh, not book smarts, but the ability to you know uh, your your surroundings, people. Your you know like people skills are high. Your your yeah a quick analysis skills of human beings mm -hmm. and, and uh, things like that. Okay. And absolutely. That's where I shine. That's why I'm a good recruiter. I was going to say that definitely seems like something you need to do. I could not be a recruiter. There's, there's not like we're different in a multitude of ways. And that's one of them where that is not my personality type whatsoever. Um, but that's cool. Cause we need them. 
And oh, but there was a reason I was bringing that up. Oh yeah, because your other jobs outside. So you're you're doing that. You're a regular here on the Chase Thomas podcast. One of your biggest positions um, that people ask. Most you important. About. I don't know about biggest, but definitely most important for sure. And then you also are apparently like an under the table white claw rep, which I don't understand. Like you're just you get stuff from them all the time, and now you're just like. Hey folks, do y'all want to know what the new flavor tastes like? Cause I've got some delivered to me here. So let me do a live taste test on my Instagram. Like, I don't understand your life, Evan Swords. I don't understand it. Well, the, the white cloth stuff is hilarious because it all ties back to Twitter. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for how great Twitter is as a social media platform. Um, I mean, the and- love is not returned. You're on account number four. <laughs> what are we on? Yeah. Well, that's because I, I can't get a hold of a real live person, uh, but maybe <laughs> one day. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, you know, throughout all of my Twitter uh, accounts that I've had and talking about football and obviously the 49ers, which has been such a passion to me, you mm-hmm. know, one one day, uh, one of the people at, at White Claw reached out and, you know, I mean, you followed me for a long time. So you kind of know, like originally I was just like, oh, White Claw just came out. I really like White Claw. I've never mm-hmm. been a big beer person. I really thought beers taste trash. I hate IPAs. So, right, White Claw comes out, and it's this 5% alcohol that they try to make taste reasonably good. And they're easy to drink. It's only 100 calories. And, you know, for me, I like, you know, lifting and taking care of my body. Yada, yada. I'm like, oh, this is great. I live in L.A. It's a great, you know, sun drink, being out at the pool, the <laughs> lake, whatever, yada, yada. Like, it's a, it's a good summer drink. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just like, yo, this thing is for me. I'm so excited. I finally have something that I like. And it got really popular. And it became a thing where like when White Claw and all these memes about White Claw started to come out, you know, like Trevor Wallace, who was like, uh, there's no laws drinking White Claws or whatever he said. Mm -hmm. Um, People just kind of associated me as the White Claw person. So whenever there was a meme, everyone would tag me in it or send it to me. Whenever Mm -hmm. they drank White Claw, they'd take a photo and be like, yo, Evan, I just tried it. You know, like I just kind of became naturally the White Claw guy. I never Mm. even like tagged White Claw. I was never like, hey, send me free things or hey, whatever. I literally just generated, I guess, like a conversation about White Claw just because I liked it, which I think is cool. Um, Because, you know, I'm a big brand loyalist, right? I (laughs) I am. I like, you know, the things that I like, I'll shout them out. I want them to be successful. Just like when your friends do something, you want them to be successful and give five star reviews for the Chase Thomas podcast. Um, so one day they reach out to me and they're just like, Hey, you know, we really appreciate all the conversation you're driving about White Claw. We want to send you to Vail, Colorado for a weekend of snowboarding. And I'm like, uh, no, I'm not going to give you my credit card. You scammer. Like, you know, like I immediately was like, this isn't real, but it Mm. was literally from the, the verified White Claw account. So I like, was like, I'm kind of interested in hearing more. Like, let me know. Mm -hmm. And I found out, no, this is very much so, hey, this is legit. They want to send you in a plus one for free for a weekend in Vail, Colorado, snowboarding, Mm -hmm. test the new flavors. Um, And that was just kind of the start of the relationship. I am a White Claw brand ambassador. I don't get paid. They obviously send me a bunch of really dope free swag. I don't know if you can Mm -hmm. see all of it, but down there, there's a tennis racket, (laughs) as you can see. Right here, these are custom White Claw uh, painted Air Force Ones. Right here, you you can't uh, see, but right out of frame, I have a White Claw skateboard. Uh, Like a very high. Not even close. I rollerbladed okay. growing up. <laughs> but see, but, yeah. I can see you being a skateboarder. I don't know. I could see you being a skater. Counterculture. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, but, maybe yeah. snowboard, isn't it the same kind of principles? It is. Yeah. Yeah. It absolutely is. Rollerbladers mm-hmm. usually went skiing and skateboarders went snowboarding. But oh, I, I didn't know that, that went one one. Uh, I went zero four on all of that. Never really yeah. did any of the four. Well, you grew up in what? Atlanta? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where there's no mountains. <laughs> That's true. That's, so, I mean, yeah. It's really just like rollerblading, though. Uh, It's just like football and strip clubs. (laughs) No, it's mostly just traffic. Like you just spend a lot of time in a car. That's that's growing up in Atlanta. Is you just you spend a lot of time going to places that should not take that amount of time to get there. A lot of a lot of time spent in the car uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, But outside of that, Mister Swords, what else? uh, What else is new with you? How are you feeling? Any new dietary changes? Any new life changes? Any new gym stories? Other than the brand new flavor of White Claw Passion. Oh, yeah. You didn't even tell me. Just released. Yeah, you never even told me what it was. Excuse me one second. 
Mm-hmm. Is he going to get this? What's happening? We're going to go ahead and uh, you can use this as a, a little clip. Okay, this is part of the pod. I didn't know what was happening. You just got up and left the pod. Yeah, well, it. I mean, as much as I love uh, you mm-hmm. know, the Chase Thomas pod and the Chase Thomas yeah. pod followers and listeners, right. I feel like, you know, as long as this podcast is going to be out tomorrow, I've already, you know, yeah. posted about it on my Twitter. But for the listeners, mm-hmm. you could be one of the first people to know what the brand new White Claw flavor <laughs> is. It's this not is even out so yet. Excited. Yeah. And so I'd like to introduce you all to White Claw Passion Fruit. Brand new flavor, not okay. even out yet. Literally a Chase Thomas podcast exclusive. <laughs> Brand. <laughs> yeah. How so is it? What does it taste I, like? What, so describe I, the I, taste. I tried it last night. So that like yeah. my claw in general has a bunch of different flavor profiles. Like mm-hmm. mango and pineapple are very, very sweet, kind of like syrupy, sugary. Mm-hmm. Um, lemon and lime and tangerine are more seltzery. Uh, do you ever like have like a vodka soda or a tequila soda when you go out? What you're just like a you just got like a black coffee, right? Like <laughs> basically that was your drink of choice when you go to the bar. Uh, when I went to the bars back in the day, I mean you're gonna judge me, but like. Coors Light was my go-to. Like that was basically all I drank was Coors Light, and when also was- trip. Well, it was a combination. So if I was if I was doing stuff, then I was like if I was really going after it, then I was doing the combination of Coors Light and um, but uh, what is it called? Uh, green tea shots. Like the combination of those two. Green. Nothing will ever top it, top a green tea shot. Like that is so, the most delightful thing. Yeah, I will say the reason why mm-hmm. I like White Claw so much. Growing up. I mm-hmm. hated the taste of beer too. So I would always get like a Bud Light or a Coors Light and a shot of mm-hmm. tequila. Shot of, you know, shot of tequila yeah. to get drunk. And a, yes. the beer just to be able to talk to people mm-hmm. while well, you have to have a sip and drink. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, this passion fruit brand uh, mm-hmm. flavor is is more seltzery. So it reminds me kind of like a vodka soda or a tequila okay. soda, right? Where it's not like just overtly like, you know, whatever. You can probably drink a bunch of them during the summer at a pool or river mm-hmm. in, Either we are in Tennessee, so river is definitely the way to go. All right. Have you ever been tubing? Oh yeah. I love I love floating. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I obviously grew up in Portland, Oregon, which is like, you know, other than the city of Portland, everything else around it is nature. So yeah, I have mm-hmm. definitely done many of floats in my life. But you're not a nature guy. You've been very adamant on this podcast that you're an indoors enthusiast. I am not a nature person, but I am a mm-hmm. I want to go hang out and have fun and get drunk with my friends. You know, yes. when I was younger, right? Like now I'm more of a... So you're nervous. making... It was one of those where you just wanted to hang out with your friends. So you're like, if that's what I they want to do, I guess that's what I'm doing. I was making a business decision, right? <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna, I want to I want to hang out with my friends. I want to have fun. They want to go float. No, but I mean, like, I also would say, like, I'm not a nature person. But yeah. like, floating the river is not like a, oh, like, let's go to the Audubon Society and learn about bugs. Like, that's just a, it's nice out. Let's get in the water and hang out with our friends. Mm-hmm. I think that's a little bit... I don't know if that would just be considered a pure nature thing, you know? I'm a strong uh, proponent of both. I tell uh, the sports renaissance woman this. It's like it, people want to put you in boxes or they think about stuff. But I'm like, I am a strong city person. Like I love cities, like major cities. And I also love the country. That There's no middle ground. Like I love them both equally for very different reasons. Um, but there's nothing like being in downtown Atlanta or just hanging out in the city. And there's nothing like being in the middle of nowhere tennessee like there's no like those are well, the two best ways to do it i think you like the city but you also like being left alone and getting yes. out into the country is the best way to do that 100 percent. like the quiet and like i just it's incredible like uh yes being left alone is just the the path for me in my 30s evan but that's just like i'm you know i'm a grandpa like i've i've yeah. done it been there done that I, i'm in left alone zone like well, I you, your, zone. your entire job and career is constantly talking to people yes so it's like when you're done the last thing you want to go do is talk to a stranger that you don't even sure. know like i get it that is true um it's not yeah. like triple h goes home and like suplexes his, his wife you know like i'm sure once he's done wrestling right he wants to go home and not you know it's not like ray mysterio is like going to the store and giving someone the hurricane rana because they don't give him the discount he looked for on a can of beans i get it 
Oh, that was for you, by the way. I know you like wrestling, so yeah, I, really, I really appreciate that. Deliver that for you. You you stuck the landing, sir. Like that was good. I didn't know where that was going, but I like that. Triple H this week it could be a big week for him. He might be de- a debuting on AEW, as you know. Um, I had no clue. I knew that was literally just about the wrestlers I knew growing up. Yeah. Um. Well, very cool. Very cool, Evan. Let's uh let's hit on some some actual NFL stuff uh this yeah. evening. Um, we're gonna get to a Super Bowl preview and our predictions, but um, is there anything new? It's our time, our team. We usually start things off with our own team. You lost your OC um, to the Miami Dolphins. Uh, so he yeah. is Miami bound. Anthony Lynn has entered the fold. In Anthony Lynn. That's mm-hmm. the big one. I don't know about you, and I mean, I'd love to know your opinion, but I'll definitely like th- throw this out there real quick. That is like, let's go back to you know some of the older Chase Thomas podcasts mm-hmm. where, I, where I would literally say – Correct me if you heard this before. Kyle Shanahan needs a proven coach with head coaching experience to come in and be an adult in the room to give him insight. I always talked about how Kyle had a rookie defensive coordinator, a rookie offensive coordinator, right? Like he was surrounded by all of these people that really like had not very much experience. Mm -hmm. And I love, love Anthony Lynn who's a run game genius, but also just a really great offensive mind in general coming in, you know, he's, he used to play for uh, Mike Shanahan. He's known Kyle for 20 years. I love the idea of him coming in and giving some insight in, you know, probably much needed uh, help and perspective that, you know, Kyle probably hasn't gotten a lot lately. What did you think about it? Like, did any of those things cross your mind? It's the good assistant head coach thing where it's just like the associate head coach type, like what you're talking about, where it's not even just being an adult. It's just having a good veteran sounding board that he respects, that is someone that's going to push him, that's someone he knows and trusts. Because I think Kyle's like one of those people you have to like, he has to already respect you in a mm-hmm. big way. To And I think he has a very strong respect towards Anthony Lynn. And I think he looks at it as like a big get to be able to bring him into the fold um into san francisco but also just that like this team is now built around a mobile quarterback a swiss army knife in um and debo samuel who just renamed himself as like a wide back new position for him um you have trey sermon you have elijah mitchell this is a team that uh they're going to live and die by what they do on the ground and bringing in somebody like anthony lynn to replace a great coordinator like mcdaniel is a big thing. So I think they avoided um, some real problems as this coaching staff continues to get picked off Robert saw last year and McDaniel this year, but I think they did a great job with that. And I think Lynn is going to be a really, really good option and a really good piece to uh, getting everything back on track and making sure the Niners are okay going into next year. I think it's uh, it makes sense all across the board. And I think, um, I don't know, Lynn's good. And I mean, he worked with Tyrod Taylor, in LA um, we might know... be a good backup option now right exactly like I like the idea of bringing in Tyrod to back up Lance and just having Lance to just have another veteran in the room you, with him you actually spoke and I, I don't want to pass it too far but like mm-hmm. Trey Sermon is one of the most exciting backs to come out of the draft last year uh, mm-hmm. Ohio State really saw an incredible version of Trey Sermon mm-hmm. he didn't see the field this year. Obviously, you know, early on he had issues, uh, maybe missing practices. There was rumors about him kind of being a little bit of a uh, jerk, if you will, uh, or maybe just like an ego kind of thing. Um, Anthony Lynn coming in and being able to give maybe, you know, not necessarily be a good guy, bad cop, you know, thing like that, but like definitely just give Trey someone that he can maybe confide in or like learn from. I love that opportunity because Elijah Mitchell was great most of the year, but as we saw in the playoffs, Elijah Mitchell really wasn't able to find that magic that he found early in the year. Trey Sermon is going to be needed. Trey Sermon, the way he plays, plays very well with the type of athlete that Trey Lance is. They have the same first name. I don't know if there's anything there yet, but there could be moving. Yeah. People forget that. It's important that Trey Sermon finds success next year. And I love this hire. It's just, to me, you know, it sucks that the 49ers have lost in like epic proportions the last couple of years. But I do think that this is a great example of, whereas they have lost, this is how good teams stay good. 
You know what I'm saying? Like they, they really are making smart decisions for the future and that's how they continue. I do think it's also interesting though. There is some pressure here where it's like by bringing in Lynn, you know what you also brought in here? You brought in an interim. You brought in someone that if it's not going well, Kyle, and Trey Lance is struggling through 11 games, you have a proven head coach waiting in the wings who can manage this thing the rest of the way. Like it's one of those where I, I don't think that will happen, but that is something to always keep an eye on is like if things were to go bad, you have an associate head coach who can who could step right in and fill that void if it came to it. So Anthony Lynn is like literally like 20 years. Like Anthony Lynn is like family to the Shanahan's. Like mm-hmm. if that were to happen, Anthony Lynn is not staying around. You know what I'm saying? I think more so that I, and I wanted to speak on this too. And you make a great point just in terms of like the, that head coaching experience. Mm-hmm. The 49ers saw compensation for a minority head coach uh, hiring in Robert Sala, right? Uh, they are going to see compensation again for a minority uh, coaching hire from uh, Mike McDaniel, right? If Anthony Lynn comes in and, you know, already has head coaching experience and then goes on, you know, to become a head coach again, which I do think he has the potential to be a good head coach. I think, you know, he obviously had some issues. Um, we'll have to look at the Shanahan organization with the 49ers as – as I wear my Megan Reyes, uh, shout out to Meg uh, Reyes, yeah, uh, more female black with Latinx indigenous voices in sports. Like they're doing a very good job of of you know being, you know, what's the word? Being an advocate for yeah, you know, the minority class and in, in in uh you know in sports in general. Like they've done, I mean, so many hires have come from this coaching tree already and it's just it's an incredible and i think that's another great move right like if anthony lynn comes in and he's here for a year or two and then gets a head coaching position like it's great he deserves another one i think he's one of the coaches that um definitely deserves um another shot and he wasn't a disaster in la he's pretty solid per and he's a good coordinator hire he's a good uh, I liked who he did on that front, and I was just kind of like, I don't, I don't know. I think Lynn is one of those who should get another shot somewhere um, after this run in San Francisco. Uh, fingers crossed it all goes well there. Um, on the Falcons front, man, uh, not a whole lot. Kyle Pitts scored a touchdown in uh, the Pro Bowl, and they made a big joke where Kyle Pitts, I think, <laughs> tweeted out that, like, my first touchdown in America or something. Yep. Um, that was great. Uh, love that for our – Number uh, top 10 pick in the past uh, 2021 NFL draft, uh, not scoring a touchdown for my team uh, this past year. So that was that was fun. Um, but, man, there's so much uncertainty with uh, where the Falcons are going to go um, in the draft. Uh, Calvin Ridley complicates everything uh, with what the Falcons are going to do. Grady Jarrett, could we move him? Um, you know, I was I was down bad when I spent like 25 minutes watching Darren Hall tape this week fourth round pick and watching his stuff late in the year and i was like oh he might be something because he was he had to step in with isaiah oliver going down late but um i don't know the nfc south is up for grabs next year evan brady's out of the bucks the panthers are an absolute mess and the saints are now uh going with dennis allen so i mean it's the nfc south is suddenly just right there for the taking for Atlanta. Um, and they have the most continuity uh, with Ryan and company, but I'm very I curious got, to see what the Falcons do this off season. I can't say that enough. People like, you know, Dennis Allen is a safe hire. He's got a lot of respect within the organization with the saints. And I, I, you know, I appreciate that he's got head coaching experience all the above. I think the saints are, have a long road ahead of them. Mm. Uh, I think the Panthers, uh, you know, they've gotten close to having some success, but I think with what's happening with McCaffrey and what they might look to do this off season, like, I think there's going to be a lot of instability there too. It is funny, but like, realistically speaking, the Falcons can make some good moves this off season and real, you know, they really can actually like compete to take over the NFC South, which is not something I don't think I would have expected at the beginning of last year. You know, it'd be nice if Calvin Ridley was back, um, but I have no idea. Well, he'll be, he'll be, he'll be, he'll no, play. He's, he's played his, yeah, he's yeah. played his last. Just not with the, with not with the Falcons. All I want is an explanation. That's all I want. There's been no explanation. There's been no further comment. Like he's just gonna be a Patriot, and I'm just gonna hate it. Like he's just gonna be a Patriot and a Pro Bowler next year, and we got some compensation, but we're gonna have to use 
what sucks, Evan, is that like we're going to have to use one of our high picks on a receiver. We just have yeah. to. And we shouldn't have to because Calvin Ridley was a hit. And this is just uh, – I'm very frustrated with that stuff. But, um, well, let's talk about some of the other head coaching changes, Mr. Sword. So we have Dennis Allen get the job uh, in New Orleans. He's promoted from within. Um, I had Ross Jackson on, who folks will hear after this uh, portion of the pod of Locked on Saints. Ross um, Ross Jackson, who is currently in L.A. at Radio Row is. in my yeah, we city. Want- yeah, we had the video of uh, him in Radio Row. It's pretty cool. It was like I was on Radio Row with him. It was pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Um, so shout out to Ross and the good folks over there. And we talked all about the Saints and where they're going and all that kind of stuff. But the big surprise was Lovey Smith to the Texans. Your guy, Mike McDaniel, going to the Finns. Um, I don't know. I think this is, this is pretty fascinating uh, across the board uh, how the chips ultimately fell here. Of those names, who are you most uh, who are you most curious about going into next year? Well, I mean, curious is a it's there's a it's a broad word. Mm-hmm. I am very curious about Dennis Allen because I think he's a good coach and can have success, but I think there's a lot of issues in New Orleans, so I'm kind of wondering how that play out plays out. Um, but you know, CJ McCollum just went to the Pelicans, so they're a basketball town now. Um. <laughs> No, oh, but real. You you're you're Blazers, man. They're ripping them. Blazers are doing fine. I don't know what people are talking about. Like this is fine. Like Bla- Dame's out for the year. You're recalibrating. You have cap space. I'm making the case for your Blazers, Evan. I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna withhold judgment on what they're the, doing. For the issue, like, yeah. The issue with the Blazers is and always will be their inability to sign free agents. Yeah. And big name free agents, right? They're always bargain bin shopping. Not no knock on the Norm Pals of the world, or mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, the Gerald Wallaces or anything like that. But you know that's their big issue. So I do, I do think that they are they're clearing the board to have room mm-hmm. to do something. It's just a matter of if they can execute. Uh, but to answer, yeah, your, yeah what were you going to say? By the way, I don't want to just. Well, no, that was just uh, what I was getting at there. But I uh, I don't know. I'm curious, like with with those names, like. Um, who stands out to you? Um, what What are you curious about? Like, is I it think with Daniel is it with Allen? What uh, What are you most curious about? I so first and foremost, I am a homer, but I am a Miami Dolphins fan now. Um, okay, absolutely. You know, the organization obviously is a little trash uh, <laughs> lately in terms of what happened with Flores and stuff like that. But I do think there is room for context, and we'll see how that plays out. But I am absolutely excited for Mike McDaniel um, to, you know, potentially give some life. Miami Dolphins are a football team that I, I feel they're like one of those teams where like when they're good, the NFL is mm-hmm. better. I think the Dolphins are the type of organization, like, you know, especially whether it's Ace Ventura or the 1970, you know, seven Dolphins, the Don Shula, uh Dolphins. Like to me, the NFL is better when they're good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's been a long time since that's happened. Uh, and I don't think two is the answer. You know, I think you might be a little more positive on that than I am. Uh, it does feel like Mike McDaniel just saw uh, Hawaiian Jimmy Garoppolo and was just like, let's go. Let's make it happen. Um, but more talent, though. I think he's naturally more talented. I don't know. People forget what he was doing in Alabama. The kid's talented. And I think people I, I'm most curious with him. It's just like, can he fix the offensive line? Like, that's the main thing. If he fixes the offensive line, I think two is fine. You can win with two. You can win the AFC South. You can win – or the AFC East, excuse me. You can win the AFC potentially with Tua Tungawella if the rest of the roster around him, similar to Jimmy Garoppolo, where if you get the right pieces around him. But it's just it was just Jalen Waddle. And that offensive line was a joke last year. Their running game was a joke. Tua yeah. Tungawella gets all this crap. He wasn't the problem in Miami last year. He, yeah, he wasn't the problem, but it's the quarterback position, as we all have seen with yeah. uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. When you have a team that has some talent and they're not living mm-hmm. up to that, the, the quarterback's got to get the blame. And, you know, when you're a, a quarterback that was drafted over Justin Herbert, you come mm-hmm. from Alabama, when you're one of the most winning uh, quarterbacks in college football history, there's going to be high expectations. Um I am curious to see who Mike McDaniel takes from the 49ers organization from a coaching standpoint, but Mm -hmm. also from a talent standpoint. They have a couple of key free agents this year. Um, Who are you thinking? Lakin Tomlinson. uh, It's a guy that's going to get paid, whether it's with us Mm -hmm. or another team. And I'm sure a guy like Lakin is going to want to be very familiar if he does leave 
uh, the 49ers and, you know, going to uh, that type of offense seems like a layup for him. So Mm -hmm. I I'm curious to see what happens there for sure. I'm pretty optimistic. I thought that was a pretty good hire because I thought they were going to really mess up here. I did not think they were going to go the right way, but they also did the thing that you and I talked about, which was that like with the Flores thing, you can't like, they had to go offensive coach. Like that was something that he did miss on was just hiring the wrong OCs. He did the co OC stuff this year. Um, a lot of this falls on Chris Greer too, for missing on Austin Jackson and missing on developing this offensive line to give to enough um, to succeed um, a la Joe Burrow with his wide receiver grouping right. and CJ Ozoma. And like, it's just, he didn't have that. Justin Herbert has all these weapons in LA to a dozen. And I think there is context needed when talking <laughs> about Tua. And I, uh, I'm pretty optimistic. You just had to find somebody who believes in Tua. And I think your point about he clearly believes in Tua. Um, I think that has to be part of it is like when you move on from Flores, who's a good NFL coach, the reason you're moving on is because you don't think um, he got enough. He doesn't believe in Tua and you're backing your quarterback. And it's also like, I love the context of, do we not remember the Miami Dolphins history to this point? Like the last 20 years of quarterback play in Miami where you're just like, first off, all- Chad mm-hmm. Pennington, mm-hmm. To put some respect on Chad Henney and Chad Pennington. <laughs> right, exactly. John Beck, Cleo Lemon. I mean, I can go up and down the list, and like uh, Oregon Duck legend, mm-hmm. Joey, Joey Harrington. Joey Harrington. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like they've had, uh, they've had nothing but bad luck across the board. There. How about give to a couple years? How about just wait this one out for a while? Like this is the most talented quarterback you've had in the room in decades. Like just ride this out he's also just a likable dude like just just do this and if there was a disconnect there then i understand why you had to change gears and you had to go with an offensive guy who comes from one of the most successful offensive coaching trees in the nfl like sean McVay, kyle shanahan mike mcdaniel you go up and down the list i mean anthony lynn has had success you can just go up the shanahan like you said the shanahan coaching tree is great like kubiak he won a super bowl in denver like it's one of those where if you're going to go all in on a quarterback and you need to know that you're going to put him in a, the best position to succeed, guess what? I'm going to go with the one who got Jimmy Garoppolo to two NFC title games in three years. That's the guy I'm going after. And I think Big Daniel, um, super likable dude, likable story, all that. I'm I'm excited if I'm a Miami Dolphins fan on February 8th. I would say this. We looked at Jimmy Garoppolo as a guy that was, you know, good enough in a lot of ways, not good enough Mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, I think Tua can be that quarterback right now. Mm -hmm. And he's also on a rookie contract who's not poised for some giant contract extension, right? Like Mm -hmm. right now at this point, you're not going to give him that $150 million contract that, you know, another quarterback like Lamar Jackson might get eventually. He's got a couple of years. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I absolutely think that at the very least, he can be a bridge quarterback. At the very be- best, he could be, a you know, a starting quarterback for the team. Uh, they're in a good position. Uh, they have to make some draft picks. You know, they, they I've always thought they've had decent talent. They just haven't really taken advantage of it. This is a great time for the Dolphins, right? The Patriots are getting better, but they're still, by all means, not fully back. Um the Jets have no idea what they're doing at all. Uh, isn't it kind of funny that the two Kyle Shanahan disciples, though, exist in the AFC? Yeah. East? That's true. So, offense yeah. versus defense. Red versus blue. Squirtle versus Charmander. Oh, oh how about this? Who do you think is going to be the most – who is going to be a co- – who is still the coach after four years with their current team? Because both guys are not getting four. Who do you think I've, gets four? I think McDaniels does. I think Salah's okay. – I mean, I you can't not say Salah right now with how much they've struggled so far. You know, Zach you, Wilson you obviously... has to pop next year. Yeah, it comes down to Zach Wilson for him. If they missed on Zach, then it's over for him in, uh, in New York. I bet you – I'll tell you this. I, I feel bad for Zach Wilson that he doesn't have Mike McDaniel. I bet you yeah. he's wishing he had a Mike McDaniel right now. He's probably wishing for a lot of things over there in, uh, in New York. But – um, he's living his best life. He was at the BYU game. BYU who got crushed at Listen, home buddy, Gonzaga. You're probably one of the only human beings on earth that would say he's living his best life and follow it up with he was at the BYU <laughs> game. <laughs> That's a beautiful sit. Like you need to go to Provo. Um, a BYU football game. Like there are some great views at BYU. Um, shout out to the Kooks. 
Great look, great uniforms, great area. Utah's beautiful. I I've been to, to I've been to Salt Lake a a, a few. How Salt Lake? There. Salt Lake is one of the most boring city. You know, Salt Lake <laughs> is the most boring city I've ever been to in my life. It, See, I'm not, not joking. You. It is, no, deal. but even no, no, no. It's not even you. It is this mm. tiny city mm. with nothing in it. Absolutely yeah. nothing. <laughs> even for like boring people, there's nothing there. Now there are <laughs> mountains, Park City, mm. Brighton, right. Some of the most amazing snowboarding I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Really love snowboarding there. But yeah, their city is, you know, I grew up in a small city that had like stuff. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even have that. Have you broken anything snowboarding? I've never broken a bone. Huh. So have you never really had a bad injury hitting the slopes? Um, no, hitting the slopes, no. I have a, my, my brain does a very good job of, not allowing me to do things that will potentially hurt me. Okay. Uh, I've never been the kind of guy to want to get into a fight. I re- I was never the guy that was like, oh, let's go jump off this bridge into water. You know, yeah. like I have a pretty small threshold for like danger. Okay. So like even when I go snowboarding, like I'm not like full send. I'm like, I love just going <laughs> – you know, I love going down the mountain. I love cruising. I love cutting, you know, cutting through snow and stuff like that. I would like to go off jumps and I've done a few here and there, but like, you know, I, I just like, when I see like, it's shout out to the, the winter Olympics right now, when I see those acrobats in the air flying up and down, like my body can't even comprehend mm-hmm. what it would be like to do that. Did you like, see the winter was it the winter olympics or the x games um with the guy who bounced off the one snowboarder and turned it into a flip on the slopes you know what i'm talking yeah. about yeah I, i'm you know I've, i follow snowboarding fairly decently now at this point yeah you know snowboarding for the last 20 years has been all about aerial flips and things like that and now recently mm-hmm. you've snowboarders have started to think more about how they can manipulate uh the ground and snowboards like in ramps and things like that like a lot of uh, of a lot of the more popular tricks lately are like less about getting as high in the air as possible, but more mm-hmm. about like kind of like an acrobatic. What can you do on the snow, close to the snow, like doing uh, like a backflip or something while also using your hand to plant off the snow as you're going off? Like really interesting stuff like that. So it is. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Have you done a flip on a snowboard? Yeah, absolutely not. Okay. On a trampoline, What's the craziest many, thing you've done many of the times. Wait, so what's the craziest thing you've done on a snowboard to this point? Um, on a snowboard? hmm I mean, I you know, I, tabletops. Uh, what is that? Like, rails and tabletops. Uh, so a tabletop okay. is like a box, right? Uh-huh. That's what it's called. So just kind of uh-huh. like not even that fast, but just kind of going and just kind of like, you know, bouncing okay. off it, sliding down a little bit, hitting a rail. And then I tried to do a rail that was like very low stakes and I, you know, fell like pretty handedly. Um, like I said, I am not a, I'm not a danger advocate, you know? Have you seen anyone else really eat it? Oh God. Yeah. But I mean like just because of the nature of snowboarding being around like, like half injury, the- like a bad injury. Have you seen anyone just oh, like break yeah. an ankle or something? No, 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 no. Okay. I've definitely seen people like, I mean, I myself have like full scorpion, right? Or like your legs <laughs> come over the top of your head. Uh, but no, it's incredible. Full scorpion um it's a yeah i've never hit the slopes uh the sports renaissance woman wants to make me go skiing at some point i don't know man you would I... love skiing you're so boring you would love it <laughs> skiing is absolutely for you it's a very casual relaxed you know this is why fishing works so well for me at my age like i like just you're ne- like one day the pod's just gonna end and it's because like i just never left the water like i'm just in i'm like in a cabin by the lake and i'm just doing that every day and that's it i'm just like uh, that's that's how i'm wrapping up here yeah Read I, feel my like, books. I feel like if you and i like merged as to one human like mm-hmm. we'd like be a full a full like all-encompassing human being because like it's possible i cannot sit still for fishing mm-hmm. i just like my brain just can't handle that mm-hmm. so like See, it I'm, relaxes me like that's it turns my brain off and it's like one of the most therapeutic running and fishing like running like my run today was like today was best running weather ever like 50 degrees is the is just the creme de la creme for running like it's unreal how good you feel running in 50 degree weather 
Um, and I've missed that so much. And with my knees back, like being able to hit that every day, like hitting the pavement, super therapeutic, super therapeutic, but like my brain just shuts off and I'm just so relaxed on my runs. Like, um, it's amazing how unaware I am to my surroundings when I'm doing that. Those kind of activities are just my bread and butter to just like not think about sports or the pod or work or anything. It's just, you know, what is very therapeutic that I think you can appreciate Mm. chopping vegetables. Okay. I don't know. Like, I don't know what it is. Cause I like, I don't do many things that are like relaxing. Like my downtime is like playing like aggressive call of duty and like, <laughs> you know, like just like really like competing as much as humanly possible. At, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, but every time I like have to cut vegetables for cooking and stuff, I'm like, this is really very therapeutic. I'm just kind of like, yeah. just mindless, just turning the brain off and go. This naturally brings us uh, to Kyler Murray gosh what's going on there evan what do you think if you had to your best guess on what do you think kyler's end game is here what would you guess it is well i mean unfortunately um i can't just guess because i do know some things that i can't say out loud wait uh, you can just say sources say that's all you no, gotta do you throw no, sources and say in no front of it. no i can't um what i will say is this okay kyler murray is in the middle of a negotiation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Steve Keim is very notably, and you know, I mean, he's got all the track record. Um, what word? Kind of a d bag, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's just—I mean, look at his track record. He got a DUI. Uh, he's always like kind of like that. Whatever. I would imagine Kyler is probably looking at this situation like, give me the—I I, want to be the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. And I think he deserves it, right? Like he, you know, like there's going to be a higher paid quarterback after him. There will be higher paid, you know, highest paid quarterback before him. He's just simply saying, like, give it to me. And I would imagine that that's just maybe not going very well in terms of like him wanting the respect that he feels he deserves because he very much so is the reason why Arizona has seen a resurgence lately. So I would imagine if contract negotiations stalled or aren't going great. Uh, you know, what does your agent do? Go to your social media and get rid of literally everything that says Arizona Cardinals. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's going to generate a conversation. It's going to make people think there's something wrong. It's going to get fans freaked out and scared. It's Mm -hmm. a great move, right? Yeah. I just don't think if you're Steve Keim or Keem or however you pronounce it, you don't have, you don't have any negotiation power here at all i disagree um i think he does so if kyler so this is interesting this we haven't seen this before and i wonder if we start to see this more uh with these young quarterbacks um and i'm sure he looked at josh allen who got paid after his early success in buffalo and stuff like that but the problem here um if you're the arizona cardinals is that like you just watch what the seahawks did with russell wilson which was that like we found lightning in a bottle we were able to spend a bunch of money around him he was on a rookie deal. We got our Super Bowl. Bing, bang, boom. Paid him after the fact. Life got significantly harder year over year after paying Russell Wilson. The Arizona Cardinals, no. They make Kyler Murray one of the highest paid NFL quarterbacks going into next year. Their lives become increasingly more complicated. The window for the Cardinals to win a Super Bowl becomes extremely limited. You can't bring in DeAndre Hopkins if Kyler is on the kind of contract that he's in before that. So... Kyler, and I wonder if more athletes misunderstand this, where it's like, you're going to hurt the team. Like, ultimately, what is your end goal here? Because you're a franchise quarterback in the NFL. You are a top 10, top 15 quarterback at worst right now, Kyler. Barring injury, you're getting paid. You will at some point. It's like this never-ending cycle where you're going to become the, the, like, Kirk Cousins was there at one point. Jimmy Garoppolo. Like, you're eventually going to be at the top of the quarterback food chain. Let's see if we can win a Super Bowl before you become top of the food chain. Let's see what we can still put around you before we give you the bag because the bag's coming. It came for every quarterback, like, and it will never stop. This is a quarterback driven league. Super Bowls are won this way. I don't know. I'd be like, man, we'll just find another one. We can find Kyler Murray's, man. We can find quarterbacks. Oh, come There's, on. Yeah. Come on. You have can you find seen Kyler Murray's? Who doesn't have a good quarterback anymore? It's not Look about a league. good quarterback. It's not about you know it's not about have a good quarterback. 
Who well, what I'm saying is, like, who it's are the, almost some of the impossible. Most exciting now. quarterbacks in the NFL right now. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with that, but what I'm saying is, like, you just you can't do what they just did. That. No, they did. So what I'm saying is that they, they, they can do is they were like Rosen didn't work. Guess what? We're doing it again. We're just go. We're wasting another quarter. Like you can go first round quarterback every year, and eventually you're going to hit on another superstar. That's what I would keep doing. Is like if he wants out and he wants to get paid before that five year window. Guess what? You're out of here. Like unless you're Peyton Manning, uh, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers 2.0, you're out of here. Like that is how I would do it because it's like, what's the point of having a quarterback on his rookie deal if he wants to get paid early? Like that defeats the whole purpose. This whole advantage that these teams have when they. But here's the th- okay. Here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Is there an advantage to a Super Bowl run and window when a quarterback is on a rookie pay scale? Yes, absolutely. Does that mean that every single team is obligated to try and win a Super Bowl only during a rookie contract? No, absolutely not. It is a business. Kyler Murray's job is not win a Super Bowl. I mean, before. that should be his focus this early. No, in no, 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 no. Kyler, Mur- Kyler Murray is one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. He's very exciting mm-hmm. talent. That's going to be a very good quarterback for a long period of time. God willing, hopefully. His job is not help the team win a Super Bowl while he's not getting paid. I mean, he's getting yeah. paid. He's, no, no, he's no. getting paid. No, 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 no. We've seen injuries happen. We've seen what happens. No, He's got some he endorsements. Kyler's no, fine. No, 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 no. You need to stop with that. His job is not to be fine. His job is to make the most money that he deserves to make. Well, that's not his job. Playing the game of football. That's mm-hmm. why he's here. He is here. It is a business. He is here to make money because he has a... He has a talent that is, you know, it, that is a part of a multi-billion-dollar business. Mm-hmm. And can they win a fo- how many how many Super Bowl winning teams last ten years did it on a rookie quarterbacks? Now I have to pull this up because um, it's Russell can... Wilson. Mm-hmm. Let me think. Was it Patrick? Uh, I think Patrick well, Mahomes got so paid. This is something we have to mention. So it's not a rookie scale, but. The Patriots, Tom Brady taking less year over year and always. Yeah, but he took less and it it wasn't like rookie pay less. No, I mean, he was not one of the top 10 quarterbacks in football. Like he was someone who still took less so that the team can continue adding pieces around him. For the the sake of it, rookie contracts. Uh, Carson Wentz technically um, because he got injured and then Foles got he was having to be. But even but Uh, even still, I wouldn't call that. That's just a dumb luck. Joe Burrow right now. Um, hmm, let me see. Just, Russell I'm Wilson is the winner. Russell Wilson is the winner. I'm going through here. Lamar was close. Um, right, but that's what we're talking about. Super Bowl winners, because that's yeah. the whole point. It's but not about the Patriots getting to the playoffs. cloud a lot of that. What I'm saying is the Patriots cloud a lot of that. Um, Mahomes did it. I forgot about Mahomes. Right, that's what I said. Mahomes and Wilson are the two te- the yeah. two quarterbacks. That's, but they also, I don't know, that it's a lot of Mahomes, a lot of Brady, a lot of the same same faces. So I don't know if that's the best yeah. value judgment there. So that's, to me, it's just Kyler Murray needs to do what's best for him and get paid. That's, you know, he's going to work. He's helping them win football games. He's turning their franchise around. And it's it's time for contract negotiation. Like, but if you're a Cardinals fan, do you have a right to be really pissed at Kyler Murray at the moment. No. Oh, see, I do. I think you have a right to be pissed off about this. <laughs> One sec. Excuse me. <laughs> there is never a time or moment in any NFL player their entire career where their their number one priority should not be do what's best for them to make money. Mm-hmm. Never should they give up money. You're not giving up money. Tom, you, you, the big thing that people talk about is, oh, Tom Brady took less. Tom mm-hmm. Brady was making millions of dollars on the side with this side so business. Kyler. No, with his side business that was specifically connected to the organization. Okay. Kyler Murray doesn't have that. Endorsements don't count. Tom Brady was making more, more mm-hmm. than every single other quarterback in the NFL with his little TV 12 through mm-hmm. the, the Patriots organization. He wasn't taking a pay cut. He was just doing it in a way that is not technically cheating, but is cheating period. All that being said, there is something to like, he, 
taking the pay cuts and doing stuff like that and getting paid older. Like Kyler hasn't proven anything yet. Can you win a playoff game? Can you do something before you just, I, I don't know. I understand. And I agree with your general point, which is that these guys have to look out for themselves because these teams are not going to look out for them. I agree with that point. But if you're a fan, you're like, hey, we find like a Cardinals fan. You're like, wow, we finally have a superstar quarterback, a franchise guy. We have this cool window where our offense is awesome. We have DeAndre Hopkins. And if we're healthy, like we were able to take a swing at JJ Watt because um, Kyler was on a rookie deal. Like, that helps them to continue to build a team that might be able to win a Super Bowl. You pay Kyler now, it's just it 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 throws a huge linchpin in long term success and or short term success rather. And I get it from Kyler's perspective, but if you're a fan of the team, you have a, I think it's fair for you to be like, man, this sucks. Like this could really blow up and this could really mess up something that we thought might be a, a cool little window we had um, to spend a bunch and add the Hopkins and the Watts of the world and really go for it early on in Kyler's tenure. And then we pay him and then we just see what happens from then on out. But pay him now, all that uh, is kind of out the wayside. I don't know. I, I think if you're a fan of the Cardinals, you have a right to be mad at Kyler Murray. If you're a fan and you're mad at Kyler Murray for trying to get paid, you're just you're you're a bad fan. I should you should you hope to God that they maximize mm -hmm. their their window that they have while they are on a rookie quarterback scale? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing: How are you doing that though? If Kyler paid and DeAndre paid, but here's the thing: They did it this year. They mm -hmm. got JJ Watt. They got mm -hmm. DeAndre Hopkins. They just they, weren't healthy at the right time down the stretch. DeAndre right, wasn't but, there. But, but that's not. That's not Kyler Murray's fault. I'm not saying it is. No, no, no. But like, why is that Kyler Murray's fault? Your argument, as... your argument is take advantage of the window that they get with mm -hmm. the rookie contract scale. They did this year. It didn't work. Well, it's not a one year thing. You can do it right. for a couple more years. Right. But it is a year. Right. And mm -hmm. now, and now it's time for contract negotiations. He doesn't yeah. have, I mean, like, first off, I don't know. That's just not how my his contract, works. his contract can be written so that it is you know back loaded like it doesn't have to like it doesn't mean that next year they're gonna have no cap space like they can backload that contract there's ways to write it like i mean i'm a 49ers fan parag moth is the the greatest contract writer in probably nfl history like mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't mean that but like that's kyler murray is like okay yeah we tried we did it didn't work we had that opportunity we'll have another one next year Pay me my money. I don't know. It's just a weird vibe after two seasons in the NFL. Like, I, I don't know. It's a weird vibe for me. It's a weird vibe. By uh, the way, on that last note, uh, mm -hmm. Larry Fitzgerald was just uh, quoted, which is funny because, like, why why do you even talk about this? Uh, but mm -hmm. Larry Fitzgerald was like, I, you know, I hope that they just both, uh, you know, play nice and something to the effect of, yeah, I hope, mm -hmm. you know, I hope everything works out. <laughs> we'll see. Um, last thing we'll do our Super Bowl predictions here, Mr. Swords. Uh, Devin Hester said something this week that I thought was fascinating. And I did like do a double take, but like he thinks he should be a Hall of Famer. And I thought about it for a second and I was like, you know, I think Devin Hester is a first ballot Hall of Famer because the whole point of the Hall of Fame is to uh, just put in put something together where fans, when they go and attend it in Canton, they're like, oh, yeah that there is the best special teams guy of all time like that you need the best special teams player in nfl history in canton like he was a integral part like his opening kick return versus the colts in the super bowl with the bears was iconic and just what he was able to do was just unparalleled like across the board and i thought about it and i'm like man i think he should be a first bout hall of famer because what he did was so unique and I think he's part of the NFL story, which is that like when you think of like the last 20 to 30 years in the NFL, one of the names you that pops up is like Devin Hester was insane. Like Devin Hester was able to just change games and special teams, which most returners are never able to do like it. I thought about it and I'm like, you know, Devin Hester should be a Hall of Famer. What do you think? 
I appreciate that we talk about it because it needs to be talked about. But like anybody that thinks that Devin Hester isn't a Hall of Famer has no concept of what football is as a sport. Devin Hester completely changed a position. Devin Hester made a position that for all intents and purposes was never going to really matter. Punt returner, kick returner, like, you know, whatever. And he became one of the most exciting players in the NFL uh, and did it consistently. He broke records. He changed the game of football in terms of that position. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I understand where people are like, well, what about other people? Blah, blah, blah. blah. Like, yeah, yes. Uh, you know, I've been saying that Roger Craig needs to be in the, the Hall of Fame for a very long time now. But that doesn't mean that Devin Hester is any less deserving. Devin Hester like is absolutely a first ballot Hall of Famer. I like it. I'm glad we're on the same page there. Um, well, let's hit on the Super Bowl. How do you see it going? What's your pick? It's late February 8th. Um, you've had a, a week to think about it, Evan. How do you think this ultimately goes? I, you know... Brain says Rams, heart says Bengals. You know, I, I, I I've heard I, that a lot from smart people where they're like, all we've it, everything's brain. Like the brain all says the Rams. Like there's no way for the brain not to say the Rams here. But then they're like, but it's Joe Burrow, and like the heart says that Joe Burrow has just been in this spot the last three weeks and has just beaten the team that they were not supposed to beat the last three weeks. Maybe that's just how it goes. Um, I don't know. I. I just, I'm picking the Bengals until Joe Burrow loses. I'm not. I'm not picking against him. Here's what I thought, and this is my big. This is hard to say. I mean, the Rams just. I mean, this hurt to you, Justin Herbert. Uh, I mean, well, not just, even that. Not even that. Mm -hmm. Not even that. Matt Stafford has been in the NFL for 15 years, mm -hmm. almost. He deserves it. He played for the Lions for a very long time. Joe Burrow's not going anywhere. This is mm -hmm. his second second season. Joe Burrow is going to be around for a very long time. Their Super Bowl window with all of their offensive players paid, right? Like they're great. I don't want the Rams to win. I don't want the city of LA to win. I don't want the NFC West rival to win, but I really do want Matt Stafford to win. I think he is a guy that genuinely he did it the right way, right? He got drafted to a team was the worst team in the NFL for a very long time. He stuck around and he, you know, he genuinely came and tried to make that team better every single week. And, you know, they traded him, right? And here he is now and he's ready to take the Rams uh, to the Super Bowl. Uh, there's a lot of players on there like Andrew Whitworth, uh, Odell Beckham Jr., um, obviously Stafford, like those are guys that I want to win a Super Bowl. I hate that it's with the Rams, uh, but I want them to win a Super Bowl. I would, I would rather see Matt Stafford win a ring right now than Joe Burrow, who will have plenty of opportunities because if Matt Stafford wins a ring, I think that's a really nice way to, you know, put a little cherry on the top of his legacy. Mm -hmm. But if he loses, it'll, it'll always be like, oh man, I like, that sucks that he made it that one time and, and never won. Say he never goes back to the Super Bowl again, right? Would you bet $100 right now that Joe Burrow will never be back to a Super Bowl? I won't. He's got the Bengals thing working against him. It was 33 years in between Super Bowls for Cincy. Um, it's hard, uh, man, to get back. I it's won't. not a Chiefs thing. It's not like you're just Patrick Mahomes and you can just get back um year over year i don't know i don't think it's that simple um i would like to believe so but a uh, hundred dollars no i also wouldn't want to do that against my man joe burrow i wouldn't want to do that to joey b i'm not betting against joey b my, my point is just like but it's also it, amazing i get what you're saying where it's like he huh. has more opportunities and this is it for stafford because they're not going back next but year. i also cool. understand your point of view right where it's you you are of the mind that you are not allowed to ever go back to the super bowl unless you're on a rookie contract right like we've <laughs> That's established not that, that. Oh, you literally like it cannot be done it's just hard. needs to win a super bowl now i don't think listen let me put it this way with the right coach the right gm and and the right ownership all the above i don't think it's that hard the 49ers have been a very bad team many times, many times. And they've sniffed 
the Super Bowl five times in the last however many years. Um, mm-hmm. Been to two of them. Joe Burrow is that guy. They've got the yeah, they've got the staff. They're, they're on the contract. Like they'll be around for a while. And in a division too. Like I don't think that the Ravens are ever going to get there. And the Steelers are just got rid of their quarterback. I mean, like unless Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson ends up in Pittsburgh, like Joe Burrow's very much so in control of that division for a long time. I mean, we should see. I mean, I don't know. The Steelers, I mean, they made the playoffs again this year. Um, we'll see what they do at uh, receiver or at quarterback. I mean, I'm not betting against Mike Tomlin not to figure it out. Um, and we'll see who their new GM is because Kevin Colbert uh, retiring up there in Pittsburgh. I saw Lewis Riddick was getting an interview, which is fascinating. So uh, former Pitt player uh, back in the day, former Pitt Panther, Lewis Riddick. Um but yeah, I don't know. I think it the odds are better than the NFC. The NFC is more jumbled at the top. Like the NFC is the better conference, and it's been the better conference for the last couple of years now. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't know. That's a good Ben Roethlisberger. You say that. That's a very. I like that. That's something that we should focus on. Ben Roethlisberger and Tom Brady have been dominating that that division for the Super Bowl contention. And Peyton for, Manning too. Yeah. Yeah. It for was 15, those two. 20 years. So like, yeah. So uh, to wrap it up on a bow, though, as you asked, um, I think the Rams win. Okay. How confident are you? Not confident. Would you put 50 on it? I wouldn't bet on it just because I – Yeah. Hmm. I think it – like, what what are the chances that you think it's a blowout in either way? I don't think there's any chance this game's a blowout. I don't think it's an, I don't think it's a blowout unless like Burrow goes full, full like young guy implosion, mm-hmm. right? But I don't think he's not imploding. That's not happening. Joe Burrow, like if there's an implosion I, that happens in this I, game, it's Stafford. Stafford's yeah. the one who implodes in this game. I, I I don't think that that happens with Burrow, and I don't think Stafford does either. But I'm saying like that's the only like like. Thing that doesn't thing that could happen that it's not likely to happen. Um, you know, like I just think about Jalen Ramsey and Aaron Donald and Vaughn Miller, you know, and how much it probably means to those guys coming in and punching them in the mouth. Mm-hmm. And I think that Joe Burrow is more than capable of you know, it is kind of funny too to that, that like- test. The, the quarterbacks are completely different. Where, like, uh, Stafford's been the best quarterback against man coverage this season, and Joe Burrow has been the best quarterback against zone coverage. So, something has to give on that front in this one. Yeah. And I don't know, like, but I, I do think one thing's going to happen that's going to be fascinating. It's like Eli Apple is going to have a pick six in this one. Like, somebody like Eli Apple is going to have a, Stafford's going to get greedy. The nerves are going to be there, and they're going to be playing man, and he's going to jump coverage and pick off um something that was intended for like obj or something and take it to the house and we'll see how stafford responds but um i don't know man i think this is going to be fascinating the rams are the worst uh rushing offense in the super bowl since like 1988 so that tells me that they're not going to be able to hold this lead if they're able to do what the previous two teams have done which is the chiefs and the titans have been able to build leads early on the Bengals, and the Bengals are like all right, we'll see you in the second half. And I think the Rams are not going to be able to sit on a lead. I don't think that's going to be a thing. So when I think about all of that, I just, I think Burrow is going to get it done late. I really do think this game ends with the last second McPherson field goal. I think uh, that's, that's how it ends. I hope the Bengals win because Mm. it will send teams, which the NFL is a copycat league in a furious cyclone of bad decisions for the next five years. Every single team will be dra- drafting a wide receiver. They hope is, uh, you know, Jamar um, Chase, two Jamar, yeah, Jamar Chase, or even when, T Higgins. Who's the number but, one on most teams. No, 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 no. Like everyone's going to go for a Jamar Chase when there is. T- no hold Jamar on. Chase. Don't put some respect on Mr. Oak Ridge. No, T himself, Higgins Oak is an Ridge incredible. Uh, first yeah. off, T Higgins is a great receiver. And, you know, by the way, the guy they have in the slot there is probably Tyler the best. Boyd, yeah. Probably the best slot receiver in the NFL. Cooper Cup's probably the best one. 
Yeah, but I don't look at Cooper Cup as a slot receiver. That man he's a is slot a receiver, though. He's a, that man is a everything receiver. He's Tyler Boyd is not doing what Cooper Cup does. Correct. So, uh, but I, I, but yes, technically speaking, you are right. Um, but my point is this: if if the Bengals win this year, every single team is going to be like, no, we got to go get that, go that, go get that extra weapon. Let's not be smart and get offensive line or defense. You know, they're they're going to swing for the fence, and I don't think that is a repeatable uh, success. I agree. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I just think that draft is just uh, going to be one of the best. I'm still not going to quit Tua. I think there's still an opportunity for Tua to right the ship there in Miami. And, uh, I mean, just Herbert and Burrow are going to dominate uh, for years to come. But – uh, we'll see. We'll see. Cause we thought the same thing with Lamar and Josh Allen and, uh, Patrick Mahomes and do the chiefs get to four straight AFC title games or is there a fallout from the way they, they just lost. I'm, I'm fascinated by all of it. Um, as we wrap up here tonight on this very fun edition, the last pregame edition of the chase Thomas podcast, uh, forget the lines with Mr. Evan Swords. Um, Final notes. What do the people do? Another season almost oh, in the books. Yeah. I mean, this is the last, like you said, this is the last podcast we'll do all year before mm-hmm. an NFL game. So, you know, we always joke and we always talk about it, but like the season is almost over. What a way to mm-hmm. celebrate it by giving Chase the, you know, the, oh. the, the shout out that he deserves first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Uh, congratulations to you on an incredible, uh, incredible season uh of consistency like my man is like the textbook definition of consistency uh and i think that you know i i appreciate what you do and it, and i think it does deserve to be celebrated so as always make sure to give this man a, a five-star review on the pod uh shout it out right send it to your friends send it to your homies uh drink white claw brand new <laughs> passion fruit flavor <laughs> That was so bad. I was like, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. This is going to be a fun week. Um, as a guy who lives in LA, uh, you know, friend of the pod, Dalton Miller is, mm. is here at Radio Row right now, and I'll be seeing him this week. Uh, one of the, you 49- seen the flow on him this week? Yeah, that man looks like literally, uh, uh, what's his called? Z- is the guy from Scrubs. Oh, yeah, uh, JD, but what's his name in real life? Uh, why am I blinking on his name? Oh, Zach? my goodness. Zach Zach Braff Zach Braff yeah 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 uh but yeah so I'll be able to get to see Dalton this week in my own city I love that uh 49ers hub uh alumni uh and very British Nicholas (laughs) McGee who lives in Leeds England is a writer out there for a uh publication and they brought him out here for the Super Bowl and I've never met him in real life so I'm excited for this week for not only the foot, you know, the Super Bowl being the city that I live in and being able to, mm. by the way, go to all these different events and things like that. It's going to be great. Uh, but just seeing a, a lot of different people, it's a great experience. I think that's a good reminder at how great the sport of football is and how much it brings people together. And I'm really excited to just experience that and take it all in because football is about to end. And there's no such thing as the NBA anymore because my Blazers have died. You got college baseball to look forward to. In I'm sorry, what was that? What, college baseball, that? the Tennessee college, Bulls kick off. Co- college who? College baseball. I am no. sorry. I've never met him. College baseball. It's a lot of is fun. That, is that French? College? No, 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 no. Oregon State's actually a great program. You can go up to Corvallis. Go, go Ducks. State. Go I mean, Ducks. Just, they're not really good at baseball, though. Yeah, yeah, we don't, like, yeah, but we don't really celebrate the Beavers for anything in life. Mm. No. Okay. Ever. I like it. Ever. Okay. Even if you see one in real life, it's pretty cool. I want to see I mean, a beaver. I, I saw a lot of Nutria in Beaverton growing up. They're so like, uh, what? Like, ma- they're, I don't, look up a Nutria. It'll freak Hold you on. out. Is that an Literally. animal? Oh, brother. It is like a rat mixed with uh, a beaver. Oh, my goodness. Right? So that's what we would see a lot. Nutrias. Aren't those things just like terrible? What in the world? Are their teeth orange? What is happening um, here? That one's is, but no. What is happening here? They have like this lion mane, the rat tail. This is like the bulldog of <laughs> the auto yeah, family. Nutrias, uh, well, they're rodents, so they're straight up rats. Um, 
Nutrias what? are all over the place in Beaverton, Oregon. Like I remember like getting on the the the, the Max, which is their like light rail slash train. Yeah. Uh, and there would always be them like out by the pond and stuff like that. They're they're angry little creatures. This is incredible. I didn't know this was a thing. Okay. So I, I never really saw a lot of, of beavers, but I absolutely saw a lot of nutria. Nutria. I learned something new on this podcast every day. Now I'm just going to spend the next five minutes <laughs> looking. And I got to show the sports renaissance woman. She's going to love it. Um, but Evan, thank you as always, my friend. Don't forget, folks, Ross Jackson coming up after this on this very podcast. So stay tuned for that. Um, Evan, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much. Have fun this week in LA with the Super Bowl festivities and i will talk to you next week all right bud take care